Great. Uh, I think we are live now. And hello, everyone. People are still joining. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, uh, my name is Suzanne. I am the co-founder and CEO of Citrus Labs. And Citrus Labs is the fastest growing provider of clinical trials for brands. So in case you are interested in conducting clinical trials or perception studies for your brand, feel free to contact us at hello at citruslabs.com. And today we talk about a very important topic. We talk about cash flow management, uh, something that everyone should know about, especially in times like the ones we are in today, uh, where venture funding dried up a little bit and is not easy accessible, like in the last couple of years. And I am excited that Alice Chang from My Pocket CFO joined us today for this webinar. And before I let Alice introduce herself, uh, just some housekeeping, uh, there will be some time for Q&A at the end of this webinar. And please put any questions you have into the Q&A box or in the chat. Alice. Hello, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, before I ask a bunch uh, you know, of things about cash flow management, could you please introduce yourself and your company, My Pocket CFO? Sure, thank you, Suzanne. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this session. Um, I know we, um, we, we have the same investor, we belong to the same portfolio. So very happy to uh, chat with you, uh, another female founder uh, in the portfolio about um, cash flow management. Um, a little bit about me and my pocket CFO. I come from a, um, so I'm an immigrant. I came to the US, I went to Wharton, and that's where I fell in love with finance. After that, I became a basically trained finance professional. Um, I started my first career working as a FPNA analyst, financial planning, uh, financial analysis planning analyst at McKinsey, which led me to later on become the head of finance for Xerox Greater China office. So I was there for a couple of years and then I missed um, working for startups. So I came back to the Bay Area a couple of years uh, ago, actually back in 15. That's when I have been serving mostly as CFO for a number of VC-backed startups, including startup tech companies, as well as startup consumer brand companies, uh, pretty much varies from anywhere from uh, bootstrapping to uh, seed to Series B funding. And over those years, um, I have learned um, it's so much pain for a consumer brand company to uh, manage their finance. And there's very little infrastructure and support for those brand builders, uh, the founders, to uh, level up really their chance for uh, bigger financial success. And I felt like um, there's the opportunity that I might be able to do something to make an impact in this industry. So um, that's when I decided to um, to, to basically co-found my pocket CFO with my co-founder, uh, Eric. Eric comes from more of a CF, uh, sorry, CPA accounting background where I come more from, as I mentioned, financial planning analysis and CFO background. And we teamed up with a um, couple of engineers. So we built a finance management. Thank you for the picture. It's very nice uh, for you to make that. So we built a, um, I call all-in-one finance management tool specifically for the founders from uh, consumer brands and specifically, I would say for up and coming uh, smaller brands um, for especially revenue, I would say under 15, 20 mil. I feel that's the, the area where a lot of the brands are underserved 
um, by um, by by financial support, and that's where my participant would love to uh, help support and level up the playing field to to partner with you guys basically for your financial success. That's awesome, and I think specifically smaller brands, right? They they can't really afford like a big shot CFO. So I think a solution like yours uh, definitely helps. And uh, Alice, I think a lot of us have heard the word cash flow before, but yeah. can you tell us a little bit more what cash flow actually is and why it is important? That's a great question. Um, I would like to use the analogy. I actually I did a small post on the LinkedIn while thinking about this question, right? When Suzanne, you originally invited me. So um, I think a simple way to think of cash flow is to use the analogy of personal finance. Um, I think at certain points of um of of um of our person in our personal life. Um, typically you 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 started by working for some company and you earn a salary. So think of cash flow just as you know um it's mimicking it's mimicking your 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 personal uh, financial activity. So if you're employed by by someone, then on a monthly basis, you bring in your salary. like you get a deposit from your employer um, of whatever amount of money, let's say um, 10K, 20K per month, right? Um, so that's the cash flow you're bringing in, we call inflow. And then uh, typically, if you look at your personal finance, on a monthly basis, you want to pay attention to how much spending, like how much you spend on rent, how much you spend on on food, right? Uh, how much you spend on travel uh, and all the other, other regular um, uh, expenses. And then pretty much each month, um, you want to do a quick scan of, hey, okay, if I earn 10K, 20K cash inflow per month, what's my cash outflow, right? If it's, it's lower than 10K, 20K, if it's over, um, think of on a monthly periodical basis, what's your normal basically cash inflow, cash outflow, and on a net basis, is it is a net positive, net negative? Are you saving money? I would say that's the starting point of thinking about a business cash flow. It's equivalent as thinking about your personal cash inflow, outflow on a monthly basis. Um, so that's the starting point, but I would like to expand for businesses. Again, um, it's similar to personal. Personal, uh, if you accumulate um, cash, let's say you have some cash savings on a monthly basis. Over time, let's say over time for a few years, you start accumulating, uh, I call asset, right? And then you may want to use those, like uh, if you save enough cash, you could use the cash to pay a down payment. You, you would start um, buying some asset. You could start buying a house, uh, buying some, uh, some like uh, um, investing in stocks, right? So Consider all those as bad as as assets, other assets. So you you should think of cash flow as one component, the starting component on your balance sheet. But there are other components of your balance sheet, and think of a flywheel. So your cash flow could flow ideally should flow into other assets, and those assets you build up over time on your balance sheet should 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 gain value, meaning the valuation of those assets, whether it's a house, whether it's stock, they should um, increase value over time. So think of cash flow as the, the foundation, but over time, I think you should think of cash flow in relation to your balance sheet. And your balance sheet would be cash flow. Ideally, should it should reinforce your asset. Um, and the other part of the balance sheet would be liability, right? Like once you start having positive cash flow, once you start having enough asset, then you actually accumulate credit. Um, so you, you accumulate credit for yourself. If it's personal finance, if it's business finance, you accumulate credit for a business, right? Um, and then you can, uh, you, the, the credit could come from your asset, could come up from your cash, meaning your earning capability. And you can actually leverage those credit to get a loan. And, and, and once you get that, we call you leverage. You leverage your credit 
um, once you get a loan, it's called liability. And I really want um, us to think of liability as our credit, as we leverage our credit. Um, because our economy is not built purely on cash. I think right now, probably only 30% of economy is built on cash. Uh, but once you get the cash flow flowing, the flywheel uh, flowing, then you actually, you could enlarge your um, balance sheet, uh, meaning enlarge your asset and also start building credit. And then you can leverage credit by having a liability. Having some liability, would be healthy to your business would also uh, uh feel the, the the you know bring more fuel to to uh to your business growth so think of cash flow as the the origin point but but ideally over time you should expand cash flow into asset into liability obviously equity would be part of that as well so um so think of cash flow in relation to other parts on your balance sheet that will be my long way to answer this question, Suzanne. And do you think that uh, cash flow management differs for CPG brands versus other industries, or is it always the same? Um, for that's a great question too. I would say um, cash flow is 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 really critical for uh, CPG brands, consumer brands. Um, comparatively speaking, especially when you compare to like a SaaS, uh, you know, technology business, mm -hmm. that's that's because for CPG business, you you have a very long, I call long value chain. Um, typically, you, you have to invest a lot of capital upfront. Um, in terms of like for a wellness business, I understand you 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 have to invest money even in R and D, right? Even in mm -hmm. coming up with the formula coming up with a label. Uh, and after that, um, you, then, then you have to invest money in production uh, mm -hmm. and you have to invest money in inventory management. And then finally you invest in distribution. Uh, and in distribution of a consumer brand, typically you have pretty long, uh, I would say AR cycle. Um, you, you may have to wait for a month or two or three to, to get the cash back. So overall I call because in the CPG industry, I want to introduce the concept of CCC, um, cash cash cycle. Uh, what's it called? Uh, actually, I am stuck. But basically, uh, it's it, it's you have to pay attention to your cash conversion cycle. That's called CCC. Um, meaning when when it, from the starting point you invest in cash to the ending point of you you basically turn that investment into uh, collect cash like from your revenue from your customer that ccc cycle typically is very long uh in the cpg industry and that's why cash flow management is very critical more critical in cpg than some other industry especially than a typical tech industry where their uh i would say their 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 ccc cycle is is shorter and they don't have to do a lot of upfront investment. Yeah, I think, you know, what, what you mentioned with, uh, you know, first um, R&D, which means uh, formulation, creating all of the brand as well, right? And then going into production, going into uh, into inventory. Uh, so yeah, I think, you know, the, our, our industry, the CPG wellness industry does need a lot of cash in advance. But I like the the concept of CCC cash conversion uh, cycle. I think that's that's pretty that's pretty good. And you know, obviously, cash management is super important, especially when you have like bigger upfront uh, cash needs, right? And um, Alice, you work with a lot of CPG brands, and uh, I assume that you do see you know a lot of probably common financial hurdles. Uh, particular in the wellness industry. Uh, can you talk a little bit about these hurdles? Um, yes. So um, going back to the, the concept of CCC, I would say for consumer brands and for wellness brands, um, I would encourage the founders to pay attention attention to your CCC, cash conversion cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can share, um, I'm sure if you Google, you can get the formula of a, a CCC cycle. So basically there are a couple of components. 
uh, of CCC cycle. So uh, you need to pay it. So one component, um, of course, I, I think the formulation investment and, and formulation time. Uh, I think Suzanne, you're you're much better expert than, than I am. You can speak to what would be a typical uh, cycle of that formulation. Um, I think that matters. And then right after that, if you have the the um, finalized the, the 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 formula, um, I would ask the founders to pay attention to I, I call um, uh, what's it called? Hold a second. Yeah, there there are so many terminologies, right? Uh, I would um ask the founders to pay attention to uh DIO DIO basically me stands for days inventory um, outstanding. Mm -hmm. So you need to pay attention to your inventory um, conversion cycle in another way to say that. Meaning um, from the, like from from the, the beginning of inventory, meaning you 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 buy raw material or you pay a, a co-packer to produce it. Uh, that's where you put money in, right? Um, to the day that that piece of inventory got sold and you collect money from from that uh, bottle of of um vitamin or whatever product you uh you, you, you sold that a, a a average i would say uh we call inventory outstanding days um pay attention to that if you can have a way to track uh and measure that at least you know on the annual basis or half a year quarterly basis and, and try to, I would say, improve that cycle time. Um, I think that would definitely um, that that would improve or optimize your your cash flow cycle, right? Um, the other component of this cash conversion cycle, I would say, um, is uh, um, uh, we call DSO. Um, uh, basically, it it stands for days sales outstanding. Um, again, so this has something to do your AR cycle, right? Um, uh, I understand in the wellness business, as in many consumer brands business, you uh, rely on a lot of distributors, uh, wholesaler and, and retailers to uh, channel the sales for you. Typically channel sales, uh, unlike a DTC model, um, would, would take a longer AR cycle, like it. So pay attention to your AR agent, right? Uh, if you have 90 days AR agent, um, if you can somehow manage that to be shorter, like 60 days, 30 days, um, that, that would definitely, I would say positively impact your cash conversion cycle, right? Um, also pay attention to, we call DPO, stands for days payable outstanding. Um, if you can optimize your your AP agent uh, accounts payable agent, so you almost want to basically have your customers pay you as soon as possible, uh, and, and you pay your your vendors uh, as long as possible. Like take take as long as possible uh, days to pay your vendors. In that way, you manage your. There's a term called float. Uh, you have actually, a, a, you literally, it's kind of like you get a loan, we call a float. Um, you, you, you have some money actually in between uh, because you extend your AP days and you shorten your AR days. So uh, I would say manage your inventory term, manage your a AR term, manage your uh, AP term. Those are um, three, I would say, actionable um hurdles or 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 key levers i think uh, as wellness brand manager you could optimize for cash flow management nice so for example if you have net 30 right the terms as uh accounts payable ap right then uh you should use all 30 days and not pay like on day five and um accounts receivable obviously you your terms ideally are shorter than uh, than 30 days, for example. Yeah, like like try to, uh, you, you can't do this all the time, obviously, because it depending, uh, typically when you're small, you don't have much bargain power. But, yeah. uh, but just try to always manage your your um, AP to, to be longer than your AR. That's like a general guideline or principle. If you can strive for that, um, that means you're moving towards a good direction cash flow wise, right? 
Absolutely, yeah. And uh, many of CPG brands are bootstrapped, which isn't a bad thing, right? Uh, and you can get very big even when you're bootstrapping. But one important thing is uh, obviously also financial planning. And what would you say are like, the key elements uh, a financial plan should include? Yeah, yeah. Um... Financial plan um, it is dear and near to my heart because that's where I started my career. I would say um, there are uh, three aspects when you think about financial plan. Um, I would say one, one aspect is um, typically for any planning, it will be helpful for you to first look at your historical um, performance. Because uh, the plan, unless you, you are, you know, starting from scratch, that will be starting from a blue sky, I call. In most cases, um, you are in this business for a while, right? Because um, in most uh, consumer brands, per my understanding, you you most of the founders, you are, you know, you come from kind of like a product background or sales marketing background. Uh, you, you have some, have some ideas uh, you, you see some opportunities. So you dive into the specific, let's say, formulation or specific product. Uh, and, and you probably want to run some test and just to see how, if there's product market fit, if there's a market, right? Um, so I would say when it comes to financial planning, uh, typically it, it will be a good timing when when, when you have launched your product uh, and, and you, you see some signs of, I would say product market fit, uh, even though it's bootstrapping, you, you can see, like you can see a path that you can grow your uh, your your top line, your revenue and, and your customer. Um, typically that's a good time to do financial planning. I'm saying that um, that's probably pretty unconventional, uh, you know, as a financial planning professional, uh, I, I, would, I, I would advise against doing financial planning too early. Uh, because when you're too early, a lot of times when you just start bootstrapping, um, you, you don't have a, a stable operation, meaning you don't have a stable month in, month out cash flow. Uh, you don't have a stable how much investment you're going to get. It's very hard to do um, planning. So I would actually advise founders in the early stage against uh, spending too much time doing planning but focus more your energy on getting the product off the ground, like spending more time with Suzanne and uh, getting the formulation out, test it with the market, right? Um, when is a good time to do planning is when, when, when you see the product is out, uh, when you're about to invest a big chunk of money to the co-packer to pr start producing it. Uh, so that's a good time to do planning because um, as you see that, you, first of all, you, you see your your business is gonna it's gonna take on another level, uh, but also it would require a bigger investment, both investment to produce a big batch, as well as uh, once you produce a big batch, you need bigger investment to um, to probably invest into into marketing and sales. Uh, you need to investment into trade spend, right? You need to go to those trade show. You need to talk to distributors. So overall, if you see a significant uptick of investment and significant expectation on the top line uh, and associated bottom line, meaning associated operating spending, then it's a good time to do a, a, a planning. And financial, um, I would say milestone-wise, I, I would say typically when you hit about... Um, um, so then you can advise me, I, I think for other brands, some like a food and bath brands, I would say when you hit about a hundred K, um, that typically that, 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 that's to me, that's kind of the threshold where you, you, you proved, uh, at least in a small niche market, um, you can sell up to this volume. I would say anywhere, if your sales hit between hundred K to two fifty K, uh, again, for for a wellness brand, maybe you, you have your own consensus, kind of what what would be a good hurdle. Uh, I'm I'm all my years to hear your feedback, but in the, I would say typically in a CPG like for them Beth brand, um, from my observation, that's when you hit to hundred k to two fifty k, 
that would be a good indicator to to think about okay i need to do some financial planning um and when when it comes to financial planning then i would say first of all let's review how did you get to that 100k or 250k uh, or 500k level bootstrapping what are the major channels uh, you sell through, right? Um, and for each channel, how how did you acquire your customers? So uh, it's basic a look at your PNL. Uh, typically, we do a PNL review and scan, and then based on that, the second um, component of financial planning is let's try to do a forecast uh, of the anywhere between one to three year. I would say. Um, so that's the second part. First part: review your historical performance. Uh, identify the key business levers, right? And second is forecast out um, anywhere for one to three year, um, your PNL. And when I say PNL, really, I would say start with your top line uh, and do reverse engineer in terms of thinking about if I want to, if I plan to hit uh, 2x of my revenue in next year, uh, or if I want to double or triple every year for next three years, uh, what are the channels I have to expand to? What are the new formulation or new product lines I, 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 I want to expand to? So start again with that. Start with your product line, start with your distribution channel, and that will give you a sense of uh, top line, how much top line you, you might be able to hit. Um, is it 3x or 2x or something in between, right? Or something more than that. Uh, so have a gauge of that. And then do the reverse engineer to ask yourself about if I have to achieve to this top line, um, what kind of cost, meaning what kind of investment I have to um, I have to uh, come up to basically to fund the operation of that top line growth. If I have to expand to three more channels, um, what would be the cost? If I look at my current channel, uh, do I get a baseline of what's my investment for me to get to 250k or 500k level? Uh, and then and then estimate the cost associated with expanding to two or three uh, or more channels. If I have to come up, invest whatever amount of money to develop this one product, uh, how much cost is going to take me to develop uh, one or two uh, uh, new formula formulations or new products? So do the reverse engineer to come up with estimate or projection for your, uh, I call below the line, the, the operating cost, right? Including the cost of goods sold uh, the, um, and, and other operating costs like marketing sales cost. Uh, so that will be second element uh, is, is uh, forecast uh, as part of the planning, right? And then the third part is on the ongoing basis, then you may want to come up with a few key metrics. So you have the historical understanding, you have the future forecast on the top line and the, the bottom line. Then you want to identify a few, I would say key metrics so you can keep track on the monthly, quarterly, uh, as well as yearly basis to, in I would say, inform you uh, to, over the time you can tweak your, um, your channels, you can tweak your product, you can take your spending. Um, some of the key key metrics to begin with, again, very simple, uh, sales by each channel, sales by each product line, right? That will be top line. And then um, Cox, of course, very important. Um, I would say an early stage, um, you, you probably don't have, you don't enjoy a, a, a very favorable Cox because you don't have the scale uh, effect yet, right? You're still so small. So don't worry about that too much, in my view. Uh, Cox typically and early stage tends to be pretty high if you compare to with more mature companies in your industry. But pay more attention to your operating costs, um, especially about, I, I call sales related cost uh, or direct cost. So directly any marketing cost any sales hire, uh, any channel spend, because they're directly associated with your uh, volume of sales. So pay attention to, to track that uh, and, and over time, see if you can improve the efficiency of sales cost. So um, in your PNL, I would like, if you work with me, 
and beginning, I would like to identify all the sales associated, I, we call sales and marketing costs, like um, identify them separately and track them on all the related sales spending. So over time, you can get their um, spending as percentage of sales and try to improve that efficiency or productivity. That's the most important. And then you can lump all the other costs uh, into I call GNA. GNA costs the general administrative costs. Typically, those costs are not directly associated uh, with, with your sales volume. Uh, and they, they will be on the allocation basis. That will be like your salary, um, some like if you hire an operator, operations person, that will be their salary. Um, some of the general meals, uh, meals, entertainment, or travel expense, um, or supplies, office supplies, right? You can lump all of them into I call GNA, uh, and over time just track a GNA as total percentage uh, of your sales spending. Um, that's the easiest way for early stage. Um, I would say for bootstrapping or early stage brands to keep uh, track the matrix, really pay attention. I would say sales by channel, um, Cox, uh, uh, sales related costs as percentage of sales and then all the other GNA as percentage of sales. Keep track of uh, those like no more than five metrics, month by month and, and see if you can optimize that. So that, that will be like an MVP, like a, a component of, of financial planning if you want to do that. That's awesome. I also um, like the little rule of thumb, right? That after 100K, um, it's like the, the first, um, you know, threshold that you are hitting. And then once you, once you add 100 to 250K, it's time to do some financial planning because then obviously it's also really important for inventory management, right? And right now we are probably in the peak season um, for, for CPG brands right uh seasonality is real and i think right now probably all of the inventory goes out and then uh we all have to stock up again in uh you know in the new year uh once holiday season is over and uh can you recommend uh what you just discussed right can you recommend any tools or any software for uh, you know effective cash flow monitoring and, and monitoring uh, what's going on also on your balance sheet? Um, I'm going to do a shameless plug. <laughs> 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 to be honest, I I, 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 um, I found it or co-founded my pocket safe because I, I haven't seen any, any good tools out there on the market. Um, I just haven't seen any good accounting tool, any cash management tool, any forecasting tool at all. To be honest, it's a pretty, um, in terms of tool support and tech stack, it's it's really poor from my perspective, in my opinion. Um, if you do want to, um, you know, to, to manage that, I welcome you to contact me. I'm sure Susan uh, will share my contact. Uh, that That's what my pocket CFO does, is we help you basically, first of all, get I could get your financial docs in a row. Uh we we I know many brands, um I suppose wellness brands, no exception. Many brands at and early stage, uh when I talk to many founders, they 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 have no clue about their financials on a month by month basis. A lot of them they, they just wait until end of the year when they have to file tax. Um mm -hmm. they just hire some accountant. They pay a couple thousand to you know tens of thousand to to do one time filing um but but this put them at a disadvantage because throughout the year they're in the dark of their financial performance uh and and that's precisely why i encourage you to talk to me uh to use my pocket safe because once you get on board with us we do um we, we automatically do the bookkeeping for you and we month on a month by month basis uh we we do your book and we reconcile your book so month by month um you at least you get a reconciled PL and balance sheet and we also do a CPA review and CFA review where I would I would talk about all the things I just talked about uh, to review like your top uh top line sales metrics to review your COGS, review your operating 
expenses and suggest ways you could uh, uh, optimize those metrics. Uh, and, and even more than that, a lot, I would say most of the startup brands in the early stage, typically you have a negative cash flow. Going back to our topic, cash flow, uh, that's because you are bootstrapping and we need a lot of upfront investment. Um, and, and those investments, they invest upfront and the, 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 they will be looking at return probably a couple years later, like two or three or five, seven years later. Um, so you cannot measure their return in short term. Short term, you're going to have a negative cash flow. You're going to have a negative profit. Then you need to look for external funding to fund your initial uh, startup. Uh, so that's where I typically talk to founders. Again, when they're at the stage of even 100K, 250K, 500K, and a meal, typically I see those are milestones and a cup of meal, right? Um, those are all kind of stepping stones. You, I, I see portfolio brands in, in my pocket safe of they, they grow. Um, and, and each growth stage, we could plan on, on different capital sources to fuel your growth. So you may look at uh, getting a loan. You may look at uh, um, getting alternative capital. Uh, even like APAR, there are plenty of digital, like a digital APAR lenders out there. Like you could finance your invoices, you could finance your PO, you could finance your inventory. Um, and then ob obviously, ultimately, a lot of uh, founders want to get investors, equity investor, where they become a share, you know, shareholder or potential shareholder. They invest money in the long-term growth. So all those, um, I, I think once you hit above 100K, even as low as that, uh, grow to 250, 500, a meal, cup of meal to 10 meal, you will need different capital injection to feel your growth. Um, so that's where we can also talk about that. You, you need those injection of capital to feel your your month by month cash flow. Otherwise you have to be break even on a month by month basis. Um, but if you break even that may limit your growth potential. So it's a balance act. Um, so that that's where I would say, uh, I believe you, you need to talk to a, a CFO level. You need a tool to give you, uh, to review those, those key metrics. And then uh, uh, you need to take those key metrics as input and, and talk to a CFO, you know, like me to make decision in terms of, should I get more capital from outside? Should I loan, get a loan or should I get some investors money uh, or should I pour into more of my personal money? Um, based on the growth you you plan for your company. So they're all kind of uh, integrated together. Does that help? Does that answer your question? I think that helps. And that uh, definitely answers the question. I, I do believe that, you know, software like yours, like my pocket CFO could really help to to scale, right? Because that's, that's all that this is about, you know, scaling and also helping founders uh, brand owners to keep track of you know what's going on on the financial side and often for many people it's not as exciting right and I can understand that uh, they don't feel it's exciting but it's important because running out of cash is a real thing um, and maybe putting you know what you have in cash into the wrong assets for example can also be a thing um, or you know just wrong planning um, can kill companies, right? And then once you once you like went through this um, certain threshold, I think Alice, you mentioned like fifteen million, for example. Then it's probably time to hire an actual CFO, uh, in house uh, or a even part time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you may need constant. Like when I work full time, uh, in my previous company, we were about twenty mil. 20, 30 meal, uh, typically then on a week by week basis as CFO, I need to report all those key metrics um, to the executive, also to the board. Um, so that would more involve a, a stable financial operation and, and may involve more time spent, uh, maybe warrant. You will also have more capital to hire a dedicated CFO. Yeah. Awesome, great. Well, I think, it is now time for some audience questions in case you guys have any questions 
please uh, put them into uh, the Q&A box um, and then we can answer them. And in case um, Alice, they want to reach out to you, uh, how can they how can they find you? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll put my um, email here. So I just shared my email here. So you feel free to reach out to me uh, if you want to follow up or have any questions. Um, I'd be happy to, to help. Awesome, great. And while you uh, type in your questions, I also just want to quickly tell you about our next uh, webinar on January 25th. In the spirit of cash flow management, this webinar is about budgeting for clinical trials, which is a very hot topic and probably one of the number one questions uh, we get. And this will be with our own um, director of partnerships, um, Travis Proctor and myself. Okay, so let's see. Are there any questions? Yes. What is a healthy cash balance versus loan balance? Alice, can you can you actually say that, or or does it depend on the company? Um. Uh, both but but it's an excellent question um so if you go out talking to a lender typically um they they are looking for a cash balance that could last uh the company for six months at least six months so that's uh kind of like a like industry norm if you talk to any lender even though they don't tell you um, how to calculate uh, your your runway, right? So so basically, if you talk to a lender, keep in mind, uh, if they they ask you, say, hey, I need to get access to your bank uh, to check your cash balance. If they don't tell you explicitly, typically the implicit industry standard is they they are looking at your cash balance to be able to cover six months of runway, and and how to calculate roughly, I would say is um every month you have cash inflow cash outflow you can even without accounting book you can probably get from your bank statement with accounting book it's better because we consolidate all your bank accounts uh so we can consolidate we can get you a cash total aggregated cash inflow cash outflow um but let's say you 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 if we have that so on a monthly basis you you have a a net cash burn um, and then if I use your bank balance as of today, divided by the, the average net cash burn over the last, typically we use last six months, because sometimes you burn a lot, sometimes you burn less, uh, but over time we get a roughly pretty good average. So use your cash balance as of today, divided by, by your net cash burn uh, over last six months, you will get that number would tell you how many months your current uh, current cash balance would last. That number uh, um, ideally should be greater than six. From my experience, many of uh, the small comp small startup brands, their cash balance is very low, is lower than six, um, which is okay. I'm telling you, don't, don't be panicked because that's just the norm for CPG company. But when you talk to a lender, uh, when they access your cash account, make sure whatever cash account you share with the lender, accumulate all your cash from other accounts. Put that into that one bank, one bank account. This is tactical tips I'm sharing. Put that into, into that one bank account you share with the lender um, and, and, and roughly make sure that that cash balance can cover your six months of runway. That would be a good practice. So that's one tip to share, right? Uh, relating to the second half, uh, loan balance. Typically, the lender would also use a, a ratio called quick ratio to assess your um, your your loan health uh, your 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 basically leverage healthness. Um, quick ratio equals your current asset divided by your current liability. Right, your current asset equals your cash balance plus your your I believe you you may have some other cash we call cash equivalent. 
um, um, we we it, it could include your inventory, could include your ARs, your accounts receivables, uh, and your current liability typically include your credit card uh, that you have not paid out yet, your credit card balance, and, and your your short term loans basically. So that quick ratio better to be around one. Or uh uh or or bigger than one. That means your current asset can cover your current loans. Uh, if that's the case, it, it's an indicator of pretty healthy uh leverage ratio, meaning you're you're not too much in debt. Uh, your asset can cover, can pay, still pay out your liability. So those are um I think some of the uh, key ratios when you talk to a lender, even before they disclose to you, you may want to pay attention. Make sure. The ratio is uh is is roughly healthy. Make sure your cash uh is roughly you know can cover to six months of runway or as much as possible. Or better, you you should have a good explanation if it doesn't. Um, so so those are are some of the healthy quote unquote healthy uh indicators. Obviously, I agree with Suzanne. Uh, end of the day, it's case by case. Um, but but there's also this kind of I would say standard you want to at mm -hmm. least be aware of. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Okay, are there any other audience questions? Well, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Yeah. So one question is: uh, Is there a way to calculate cash runway using your EBITDA? Maybe we should also quickly discuss what EBITDA means. Yeah, if EBITDA it, it earnings before uh, interest, tax, uh, depreciation, and uh, amortization, right? Um, uh, I typically, ca cash runway, we, we don't. So EBITDA reflect your earning. It, it's a profitability um, uh, metric. If you earn positive EBITDA, it means you, 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 literally that EBITDA, that's your earning. That that would be uh, next year, like that positive EBITDA will be included uh, or transferred onto your balance sheet as part of your asset, uh, as part of your actually uh, uh, your 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 equity. So accounting wise, that that's how we treat EBITDA. It, it's it it shows your um your management capability to like you spend so whatever amount of money in a year and you can manage to make a profit, make an earning, positive earning out of that. That shows your the the shrewdness uh, of your management. Um whenever we talk about cash runway, it's it's a different matrix. It's literally we, we use your uh again your cash position in your bank or aggregated cash position from all your banks. And we use that, it's a really simple metric. We use that divided by your cash uh, outflow or uh, or your net cash outflow. Um, that's actually a, just a, a simple way to to um, to calculate your your wrong way. And when, when we when we do your cash outflow spending, again, it's important we do an average out uh, again because cash outflow fluctuates. So I would say those are are two separate metrics. It better measures your management capability to to turn a bunch of spending into uh, profitability for the company, which is really really good if you can do that, uh, especially an early stage. Uh, typically, uh, I would say it better an early stage would would be. Uh, the, and, and another term for EBITDA is operating profit, right? So or if you can make operating profit, uh, it, it really shows your operation capability. Um, cash runway typically is another, is another aspect to measure your capabilities, to measure your capability to, um, you know, to, to, to keep, keep, keep yourself in the, in the, in the running in the business uh, without drawing you know out of cash or without dying out of cash both are very important metrics um and, and shows different aspects of your management capability I would say do the cash run way first um that's if you run out of cash obviously you, the risk of dying is higher um 
a lot of the early stage brands, they, they may not be a bit uh, positive for a while, which to investors, to, uh, I think it, it's okay, as long as you can get extra capital to fuel your growth. Um, so, so cash is, to me, is more urgent, probably more critical in the near term versus ability to turn to 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 turn out a positive EBITDA is more uh, reflection of your longer term management capability. I hope that answers your question. That was great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much also for, for sharing your knowledge, uh, Alice. This was very uh, insightful. And everybody, thank you very much for tuning into our webinar today. And a little off topic, but also some uh, shameless self-promotion from my side. Uh, Citrus Labs, the host of this webinar, provides clinical trials for brands. And if you are thinking about conducting your own clinical study, please reach out to us. Uh, we're happy to talk. Just send an email to hello at citruslabs.com or visit our website www.citruslabs.com and fill out our contact form and a member of our team will be in touch ASAP. And uh, you know, again, our next webinar will be on January 25th uh, with Travis Proctor, our Director of Partnerships, and we're talking about budgeting for clinical trials. Um, in case you want to register, there is a QR code on the top uh, left of this slide and it will be super informative how to plan for your budget um, when you want to conduct a clinical trial uh, which is again typically the number one question we get as a company um, and Alice thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, it's pleasure. Thanks, thanks everybody for tuning in and have a great rest of your day bye thank you bye